Okay, so this is a reasonably complex table from the CLE framework, but this is the one that's making the link between the kinds of knowledge components that are in your domain and which learning processes are mostly relevant. So, and, and I'll try to use the functional language here. So, what's the function of memory and fluency rebuilding? Well, that's to help store facts, right? So if you if you want to learn facts, these constant, constant KC mappings, you know, like foreign language vocabulary words or new definitions in math, then the key thing you need to do is remember them. Because there's no generalization needed, you don't need induction, there's no function that in induction can achieve if the goal is facts, because the function of induction is to produce generalizations. But there is no variable pattern to pick up on here, so no need for generalization. There's nothing to explain or make sense of, so no need of understanding and sense making. So if you're after facts, then you want to pick instruction that's going to enhance the memory and fluency building learning processes. If you're after skills or rules, variable condition, knowledge components, now not induction becomes important. Memory, of course, is still important. Um, but because much of pattern induction is done through brain processes like that are used, for example, in learning your first language, you don't necessarily need much by way of deep understanding. You need practice with feedback and feedback that does help explain and make sense to some sense, but to, to some extent, but, but in many cases the practice is what's most important, especially if the rules are kind of arbitrary, like, for example, producing the past tense of a verb or saying a two-digit number in English and, you know, in mathematics, 27 makes some sense, but why 13 or worse yet, 12? So there are some arbitrariness to some of these patterns. Uh, in many cases, English grammar, algebraic grammar, the grammar used in calculus, the rules in many cases of symbol manipulation in a programming language. There's a lot going on here that we tend to forget because it's tacit. But certainly there are things, principles, where there is a rationale and then we want to have some sense-making and understanding about those. So this main diagonal is the, where the most action is, but principles, we want them to generalize if they're, and they're not associated with rule-like skills, they will, might not get applied well, and they also need to be remembered. Uh, but here's where we're not going to get much productivity, and here's where sometimes instructional interventions fail because they're supporting what isn't needed. So these learning processes you, you read about in CLE are drawn from cognitive psychology and cognitive science mechanisms lear learning, but also from machine learning, especially things like explanation-based learning. Linguistics is another source. There's a lot of research about dialogue and education, uh, a lot about classroom support for argumentation. Well, much of this comes from the cognitive psychology literature. There is cognitive theory about memory and th fluency. I've certainly been highly influenced by the ACTAR theories of John Anderson. Phil Pavlik's done great work on mapping those theories more specifically into instructional design. Uh, we've done a lot of work on modeling using AI and machine learning these some of these inductive learning processes where uh, we have an, an AI system that can learn from examples and by tutoring called SimStudent and a newer one called the Apprentice Learner. And it uses explanation-based learning, forms of induction, inductive logic, discrimination trees, probabilistic grammar induction. A lot of these are drawn from machine learning, but again, these are mechanisms, a limited set of mechanisms that seem most relevant to human learning. There's a lot of work on reasoning and dialogue. Our, our own Carolyn Rose here at CMU does a lot of work in this area. Uh, Lauren Resnick at the University of Pittsburgh as well. Um, and and the, these, these theories are very relevant to supporting sense-making. So this is another key table in, in CLE, and this tries to illustrate some of the empirical evidence that led us to start thinking theoretically about this dependency I mentioned before that the effectiveness of instructional methods, like these methods here, work examples prompted for self-explanation, whether they're effective or not depends on the kinds of cases they're being applied to. 
And this hypothesis is, is different than thinking that the instructional principles are always going to work. Um, and the textbook certainly gives examples of cases where they may not work. But thinking more deeply about when they don't work is of critical importance to being a good uh, e-learning designer or learning engineer. So the other view is, is the opposite extreme, that every domain has its different instructional principles. Klee says we get generalizations across domains if we think about kinds of knowledge components. And I hope you've seen plenty of examples of facts in language domains, facts in math domains, facts in science domains, similarly skills in language and math and science, and even principles in language and math and science. But in this paper, we, we noted studies, for example, on worked examples that worked for algebra equation solving and geometry rules and chemistry rules or prompting for self-explanation that worked in many cases, but did not work for English articles, or collaborative learning uh, in implementation that didn't work for algebra equations. And we started to wonder about this correlation here as we get more complex here, as we increase from facts to more complex skills and rules to more complex principles that uh, more complex kinds of instructional principles may be relevant. And further, why might that be so? I've elaborated a little bit on further studies that, that indicate how worked examples are not needed in learning something like Chinese vocabulary. In fact, it's better to go right to practice. That's the testing effect, as a matter of fact. We could relabel this row testing effect, and then this would be a plus sign, and these would be minus signs. Uh, so. That's a real case where we see a principle not always working. So why is it the case? Why do we think that an ideal instruction depends on knowledge goals? Well, it's because different learning processes are at work. Right? That goes back to the diagram uh, we saw before. Right? And if we break these down, we see facts are requiring memory and fluency. So these kinds of instructional approaches help achieve that learning process. Rules need induction and refinement. Principles need sense making. So we get this positive in the main diagonal. We get negatives up here and perhaps uh, some positive here, but maybe not the best thing you can do, but something you should also do. Um, and this really helps make sense of a lot of competing re recommendations out in the literature. Um, our book is more coming from the field of educational psychology and see a lot of emphasis on worked examples. The testing effect, desirable difficulty that some of the book excerpts we read from Making It Stick come more from the psychology community. Desirable difficulties, those are then more focused on memory and fluency processes. There's also a lot of emphasis in, in the educational literature on more explicit uh, collaborative learning and accountable talk kind of approaches. And those work as well too, but they work for a narrower set of very important kinds of knowledge goals. But really, all of these knowledge goals are important. You can't get by as an expert without knowing some facts, having some skills or, or general rules that you can apply fluently and without much con conscious reflection, as well as having a deeper understanding. So just to focus in on this row a little more closely to try to nail this home in a, in a more specific example, we can contrast, um, as we've often done, between higher levels of assistance that are going to reduce extraneous load versus less assistance that are going to enhance more desirable uh, processing, generative or extraneous processes. We can make it more difficult here with less assistance on an instructor's part where the students are going to have higher load. But if it's the right kind of load, which kind's the right kind of load or processing? Essential and generative, right? Then it's going to be good. On the other hand, if it's extraneous, then we want to lower it. So that's that's the real dilemma. Which kind of load is it? And if it's extraneous, we want to provide assistance. If it's generative or essential, typically we want to lower that. But if there's too much essential, then, sorry, we lower the assistance to create higher difficulty, right? But if there's too much assistance, we won't, don't want high difficulty. We want to have more help and lower it, right? So here's a case of, uh, of a knowledge component, this Chinese uh, symbol written in, or set of symbols written in this pinyin language. That means teacher. That's a study trial. 
like an example, right? And we give both A this the condition and B the response, where in a test trial we might give only the condition and ask for the response, right? And which kind of knowledge component is this we're talking about? Well, that's it's a fact, right? And this was a study, uh, these kinds of facts were studied in many uh, different experiments. I'm going to cite one by Rodiger, where they had three study trials and then a test trial contrasted with one study trial and then three test trials. So you, you see something like this three times in one case and then a test trial, or conversely, you see, and that, and that would be, you know, on this end of the spectrum, a lot of study and just one test, or conversely, just one study and a lot of tests, right? One study, three tests, right? What did they find? They found a testing effect that this added difficulty in this case for facts, right, was better. That's our testing effect. And this is the kind of material that it applies to. So here's another content domain where we might ask a student to solve a literal equation like this for A, right? And I gotta multiply both sides by C and, and then subtract the B and they get this solution, right? Here's an example. Is both the A and the, the condition and the response, the given and the goal. Here we just have the given, the initial state, and the student has to get to the final state. So that we use different language here. I mean, I'll call this a test or a test problem or a problem to solve. Here that in this literature they call this a study trial, but it's really an example. It has the same form as an example, right? One difference is that the example here is worked, so there's multiple steps versus just one step. But what's another difference? Um, what kind of KC, KCs are involved here? Are they fact KCs? Are we expected to just solve this form, or could it be A times C minus B equals D times A? It could be any form, right? We need the general patterns. In other words, we need skills, right? So, uh, that was the result when they were facts, right? And here's a study by Sweller and Cooper where, again, they use slightly different language, but it's essentially the same thing, a study trial of an example versus a test trial or a problem. Uh, no, it wasn't identical. It wasn't E, 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 P, but E, P, E, P, E, P, E, P, kind of more intermediate here, actually. Um, whereas this is all problems, like a homework assignment in, in a physics class or a math class. This would be a strange homework assignment. You're given the solutions to half of the problems? Well, that's what they did, and they, in fact, found in this algebra domain that by giving half of the students, students, giving half of the solutions, students learn more. It's not that they do better on the instruction. This is the instruction. In both cases, there's a post-test afterwards, right, where it's equated. The, the example group and the problem group get the same post-test. And the example group did substantially better. So what's going on here? In one case, we're, we're going off to this end and having better results. In the other case, we're going off to that end and having better results. Uh, why do we get these conflicting results and how could we resolve that? Well, that's the Klee framework idea. For facts, like Laoshi is teacher, it's fine to elicit recall. And so Doing that through testing, the testing elicits recall, it supports memory and fluency, so therefore it aids fact learning. But it may be suboptimal for rules because you need some more support for a more difficult, a more challenging process of induction. So there's more extraneous, sorry, uh, essential processing or generative processing needed to do those inductions in the case of skills. And so you need extra support for that. And that support uh, can come through having examples that can support the induction of the patterns and it aids the rule or skill learning. But it might be suboptimal for facts, right? So we get work examples work better here, testing effect here. But because we've changed from facts to rules, that's what tells us when to go with testing versus work examples. So figure out the target knowledge. If it's facts, then emphasize memory enhancing efforts like testing effect, right? From facts to memory and fluency to testing effect, KLI. If it's rules or skills with variable condition knowledge components, what's the learning process we need? We need induction. So more work examples are going to help there, and that'll lead to more optimal instruction. Now, 
again, you'll notice this isn't a black and white situation here. In all cases we have, except for this one actually, there's a mixture of examples and, 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 and practice. This question is more about the ratio. Um, higher ratio of examples to practice for four skills, domains that involve skills, and a lower ratio of study to practice for domains that involve facts. So that's a great example of the Klee dependency idea. And I just picked one uh, within the induction area involving worked examples versus the testing effect. And then see, notice how testing is associated with memory worked examples with induction and finding. But there are many others here that can be worked out. There's an example uh, in the extra slides for self-explanation and how it's more supportive of explanations here. Prompt for self-explanation is better than giving an explanation when you're after sense making. And I would say more complex skills that have underlying reasons that are associated with principles. It's also important for that. Um, and it's really kind of in some of those cases, like in math and science, where there's a combination of skill and principle, self-explanation is super powerful. So summary, we have this fundamental causal chain that changes in instruction, lead changes to changes in learning, which lead to changes in knowledge, which yield changes in robust learning assessment measures, uh, robust meaning long-term learning measures. We can observe what we do to instruction, the red things, and we can observe what happens um, in our assessments, but we can't directly see the learning that's happening inside the brain or the changes that are being made as a consequence of that learning, right? We have to make inferences about that, and that's where cognitive task analysis and experimentation is so important. So we start at the end, we specify goals and performances on tasks that demonstrate, tasks that demonstrate the kind of achievement we're after. Then we specify the knowledge to needed to perform on those tasks and what kind of knowledge it is. The knowledge type helps indicate what learning processes are needed. And then we pick instructional principles that best support those learning processes. CLE provides a kind of simplification of that in terms of these three categories. It is definitely more nuanced than that, but this is getting at the start of the kind of thinking we want learning engineers to engage in. So let me just go back to my answers to this. Students learn relatively little from lecture and readings. They're very important, but the learning has to continue. Well, as you listen to a lecture, you're not necessarily very good at knowing whether you're learning or not. When you actually try it yourself, that's when you really find out. Homework assignments are learning activities. They may also help you motivate going back and seeking these other sources, but unless that after looking at those, if you don't practice again, you will not learn them. Quizzes and tests are therefore part of the learning activities. They should be repeated, and we see over and over in, in learning curve data that without repetition, um, even the best students don't learn, especially on the hardest stuff. Practice with feedback is where most learning occurs. It does have diminishing returns after many opportunities. So becoming super accurate and super fast does take a substantial amount of time because of those diminishing returns. Learning is not a relatively discrete event. It sometimes seems that way, but that's because we're not looking closely enough. It really happens rather slowly and continuously as we've seen in our learning curves. So I hope now that you're pulling all of this together and you're starting to feel comfortable that you can summarize some of the CLE concepts, um, that you can use them in thinking about backward design from goals to knowledge components to learning processes, uh, that you can explain the inter relationships now between cases and the best corresponding learning processes, and then how those learning processes relate to instructional principles, such that you can choose instructional principles that match the desired KCs and, and how learning processes function to produce those KCs.